that was a devastating, crushing experience because I thought I was finished. I thought my career was done, but it was just the beginning. This is Reveal, the Revenue Intelligence Podcast, here to help go-to-market leaders do one thing, stop guessing. If you're ready to unlock reality and reach your full potential, then this show is for you. I'm Danny Wasserman, coming to you from the Gong Studios. Howdy, howdy, howdy. It's Danny Wasserman here in the Gong Studios. I'm finding myself in a state of utter disbelief because I'm about to announce who our next guest is. And when I say who his name is, I've already revealed his gender. Yes, you will be shocked to really just digest what the hell is he doing with Karina and I? Here is a forebear of the entire podcast medium. Here's someone who is showered in national and international accolades for his achievements in journalism. And with all of that stature, with all of that clout, he could not have been nicer. What I find so fascinating about this guest, in addition to the courageous audacity that he possesses to go and ask fairly and tactfully leaders of business from across the world, not about their victory laps, not about them achieving these historic milestones in whether it's revenue or ringing the bell as an IPO. No, it's him very honestly and humanely asking about those moments of failure, those moments where they were on the brink of collapse to humanize that success does come with its fair share of perils and challenges. And at the end of the episode, kudos to Karina because she really honestly asked him, tell us about a moment that was formative in your life that was really all about failure rather than success. So we could not be more humbled to bring in the host of How I Built This, along with many other programs that you've come to know and love and recognize. We've got Guy Raz in the house. You don't want to hear anything more from me. You want to hear from him. So let's put a cork in it. And as you know what I'm going to say, DJ, spin that. Ladies and gentlemen, Karina and I do fundamentally believe that the earth has stood still because coming to you at the Gong Studios is someone that certainly needs no introduction, but nonetheless bears a few enumerated highlights. Yes, in the studios today, we have an Edward R. Murrow Award recipient. We've got someone who has contributed to multiple DuPont Awards, a Peabody, and perhaps most notably, is a man after my own heart, a cast iron skillet junkie who knows a thing or two about salmon. Yes, ladies and gents, Karina and I are so thrilled to bring none other than El Jefe, the godfather of podcasting, Guy Raz to the house. Guy, welcome to Reveal. Thank you. It's so great to be here. You know, I think of Marlon Brando and the godfather, and I'm so far away from that. But thank you. Anyway, I always love talking about cast iron pans and how to season them. And I love seasoning my cast iron pans after every time I use it. It's very satisfying to see that patina on the pan once you've taken it out of that warm oven. It's really nice. I know our listeners are dying to hear about all of your pearls of wisdom pertaining to business. But can I ask, what is your go-to signature dish in the cast iron? I mean, it's it's basically a ribeye steak, you know, in, and I'm sorry for the vegetarians. I know I'm sorry, and <laughs> I wish I was a vegetarian, and sometimes I am, but except when I eat ribeye steaks, um, it, it's the best way to cook it, right? You got that crust, you got that sear, just a little salt on there, hot cast iron pan with a piece of beef, can't go I'll wrong. For all of our listeners from PETA, please excuse this carnivorous digression, Sorry. but the tomahawk in the cast iron, I think the ribeye oh, yeah. as a cut is my favorite yes. piece, but the show piece, like the panache and show factor of the ribeye when you bring it out sizzling. All right. Sorry. Yeah. Karina, thank you for indulging Guy and I as we geek out on meat. <laughs> you guys are just making me really hungry. That's all. That's amazing. All right. Well, Guy, first question out of the shoot, you've interviewed Howard Schultz of Starbucks. Sarah yep. Blakely of Spanx, Yvonne Chouinard of Patagonia. We're talking the titans in numerous industries. And I'm wondering, when you, in all of the 500 some odd leaders that you've interviewed in your illustrious career as a podcaster, a lot of them obviously have notable stories involving hyper growth, sensational success. Could you codify or distill down what those executives, what do they do differently? Yeah. It's funny because we, we've, between how I built this and, and another show I do where I interview CEOs called Wisdom from the Top, it's been almost uh, a little over 700 
founders and CEOs. And it's pretty awesome because what I do is I sit down with them for three, sometimes four, occasionally multiple sessions for interviews. The shows are, of course, edited down. I'm not going to torture the listeners with three hours of raw audio. But when you have so many people that you've interviewed over time, there's a massive data set. And so it's enabled us to kind of look at all of these people to ask ourselves a variety of questions. What do they have in common? Why are they so highly successful? Why are they operating at a certain level? You know, is Howard Schultz smarter than you? Is Sarah Blakely more savvy than you? And the answer is no. I mean, they're really smart and really savvy. But there are a couple of things that they have been able to do as leaders and that their companies have been able to do. And it's the same whether you're talking about a founder of a company like Howard Schultz or if you're talking about a great CEO like Brad Smith of Intuit or Ken Chenault, the former CEO of American Express. I mean, there, there are countless examples. And what if you look at all of these great companies that not only have scaled, but also or on the road to scaling, but companies that really um, are built to last, if you were to kind of create a Venn diagram, you essentially find three things that they all do. First of all, they all create or encourage a culture of collaboration. So it's not a culture of like, you know, kill what you eat and everyone's kind of fighting for scraps here and there and you're only incentivized to make money for yourself. Cultures of collaboration where like there's cross pollination from different divisions and you are incentivized to collaborate. That's the first thing. The second thing is there is a culture of risk-taking, right? So a place where you can try things that may not work, um, but there's it, people are encouraged to take risks. And the third part of it, and it's the other side of the risk coin, is there is a healthy appetite for failure. Now, I'm not talking about catastrophic burn down the company failure, but I'm talking about, you know, moderately reasonable failure that might be painful if it doesn't work, but is important. It's like it's like any kind of muscle that you exercise. You have to kind of essentially tear a muscle to grow it, right? And so it's a version of that. And that's what great companies do. They, they do a version of all three of these things. So the Venn diagram of all of these founders, because they are all different, they all do different things. But the one area where there's consistency, it's collaboration, risk-taking, and appetite for failure. And you describe this holy trinity, like yeah. the mirepoix, if we stick with culinary. The mirepoix, the yes. The collaboration, the risk-taking, the failure, and you've isolated that this is part of the genome of great and successful businesses. Is it intentional when you interview Schultz and Blakely and Chenard or the likes of anyone else? Do they enshrine on the walls of their mothership headquarters, we are going to celebrate failure? Or is this just intuition and it's almost predetermined because of who they are as human beings that that's just their value? Yeah, 100%. It's not like codified. It's not like companies have these successories, you know, posters on the wall, collaborate, fail, risk. It's really ingrained in how they think about innovation because it's tied to innovation. You know, I'll, I'll give you an example. You know, one of the one of the greatest companies in the world is Procter & Gamble. And you're like, Procter & Gamble? It's a dinosaur. It's 180 years old, right? Who thinks of Procter & Gamble as innovative and forward-thinking? But Procter & Gamble is an incredibly innovative company. Um, I had a chance to go there in 2019 before the pandemic and and to be exposed to some really cool stories of how they have created some of their most iconic brands. Back in, in the 90s, they were getting their butts kicked by Colgate. Colgate it's a toothpaste. Procter & Gamble makes Crest. Colgate was kicking their butt. They were trying to figure out an innovative product that they could create. And um, there was a guy working in the division around uh, oral hygiene, and he came up with a solution that could whiten teeth at home. This is a time where people were going to the dentist and getting their teeth whitened. And they were thinking at Procter & Gamble, could we bring this home? Could we make this cheaper? Could we make this a consumer product? And they couldn't figure out how to get this teeth whitener onto teeth. Well, this guy, Paul, his name was Paul Sagel. He was having lunch with another colleague at Procter & Gamble who happened to be working in the plastics division. At the time, Procter & Gamble was also trying to create a product that could compete with Saran Wrap, but better. It was called Impress. It was going to be this new product that was better than Saran Wrap. So Paul Sagel was telling his colleague about this problem he was having. I can't get the teeth whiter on teeth. This other guy says, I think I can help you. Come down to plastics. So he literally cuts him a strip of plastic. They figure out, they apply this stuff and they put on the teeth and it works. Two or three days later, they are pitching the CMO 
of Procter & Gamble on the product that I think six or nine months later is on the shelves of stores. It's called Crest White Strips, and it made $300 million for Procter & Gamble in the first year. I mean, you can't come up with a better collaboration story than that because it just shows you how a company that encourages cross-pollination, encourages people to work in different divisions, have lunch together, talk about what they're working on. It's not siloed. You come up with amazing things. Companies that are siloed, they are essentially stifling their potential because they're saying, you're really good at what you do. You stay in your lane. You stay in your lane. You stay in your lane. Companies that are like, hey, mix and match. Go figure out what they're doing over there. That's where you get internal innovation. And, and you see that again and again and again in great companies. I totally agree with that. And I think companies that are in this high growth mentality actually are most likely to stay siloed initially if they don't kind of break that barrier and understand that greatness can happen in different divisions, as you said. I would love to hear from you from who are some of your favorite leaders that display like a high tolerance for failure, right? Because I think you have to have that yeah. in order to innovate. And, and I think, and again, we have to couch this carefully because a small business and a small business is any business under $40 million. That's what the U.S. government considers a small business. So it's significant, but not every business can like take a swing that's going to lose them $10 million, right? But you could take a swing that might lose you half a million or a million if you're a $40 million business. Like it could really hurt. It could be painful, but it could teach you lessons or lead you to something that is going to actually be better. So you know, a good example of this, I interviewed Jason Citron, who founded Discord. That and TikTok are the two most successful social media apps in the last few years. Discord certainly the most successful audio social media app. And really, it, it started out as a gaming company. I mean, they were focused on making like games that they would, you know, it would be like Steam. You could download games and, and, and that was their business model. But their games didn't work. I mean, that was really what they were focused on. But at the same time, they noticed that people playing their games were communicating over Skype. And they thought, well, why don't we just build an in-house way for people to communicate while they play our games? Well, no one was playing the games, but people were using this audio communication platform to talk while they were playing games. That became the business. The video games failed. You know, but, but it's a good example of how... Failure can often lead to something much, much bigger and much more interesting. There's, um, there's a CEO, I think one of the most really impressive CEOs the last 10, 20 years um, was Brad Smith at Intuit. And what he would do when he ran into it was he basically implemented a policy where 10% of your work time had to be spent on creative work. It could be something that could make the customer's life better or your life better or the working environment better or a new product, anything. And he really encouraged people to um, to think big. And the idea was that he wanted Intuit to kind of revert to its startup roots, you know, because by that point, Intuit was a mature, huge company. How do you take a mature, huge company with a lot of bureaucracy and how do you bring it back to its startup roots? Well, this was one way he, he did it. And at, at a certain point, I think within a year, there were like 2,000 concurrent projects that people at Intuit were working on. And out of that, came TurboTax mobile, which became one of its biggest products ever. Because one of the employees is like, we got to go mobile. And other people, this is before mobile was a big thing. And other people are saying, no, our business is in, you know, the web. Well, ultimately, we know, we know what happened. Yeah, that reminds me of another classic of yours, Jamie Seminoff from Ring and his garage lab and how they just kept creating and creating and creating and creating. And he was hell bent on the unsubscribe product being the thing that made it. And lo and behold, the thing that was just meant to be a product served just for him and his use changed the whole landscape. So I love the idea of like, how do companies forge creative labs or creative garages just like Jamie had? I think ultimately what, what happens in, you know, in, in companies where you see innovation come from within, it's the Procter & Gamble model. It is incentivizing people to work together and to collaborate, you know, to reward people for working in teams. It's really interesting. I'm seeing more and more companies really lean into this idea because for most of modern sort of post, you know, industrial history, the way corporations have kind of structured their reward system is by looking at a PL, mm -hmm. you know, a divisional PL and saying, oh, you guys 
uh, made money, and so here's your rewards. And that still happens, especially in the service industry with lawyers and you know consultants. But what you're seeing more and more, even in law firms, even in consulting firms, is that there's a new bucket to incentivize people, to reward them. And it's, it's how collaborative are you? How much of a good colleague are you? Are you sharing your contacts? Are you connecting people with other people? Are you generating ideas? I mean, you're even seeing this in the way that like elementary school education is, in, is kind of shifting towards collaborative project-based learning, gathering groups of five or six kids around something that they then are graded on as a team. It's really interesting because we know that companies that are more collaborative are more successful and innovative and companies that where there's internal competition, they can do cool things, but ultimately they're also eating their own, like, you know what I mean? They're like eating their own from within. Guy, I'm taking stock of the recessionary market that we're in and yes. the heightened pressures of being in a downturn and collaboration for sure in the good times and the bad. And yet risk taking and failure those are harder pills to swallow when the stakes feel even higher, when yeah. margins are razor thin, competition is intensified. And oh, yeah, by the way, you're being asked to do more with less. What do these companies that you're interviewing, what do they do differently to navigate downturns when taking risks and celebrating failure feel kind of antithetical at this point with our economic climate the way it is? Look, the reality is that you're absolutely right. And you can't discount, you know, human psychology. It's in our DNA to mitigate risk, right? And and that's why we are here. Like we are the humans that are here. The ones that got eaten by the, you know, the saber tiger are not not here, and their ancestors are not here. Like we're lucky. Our ancestors are like, I'm getting away from that. Um, so there's no question that as we enter a more challenging macroeconomic environment, um, it, it it's natural for companies to kind of retrench and to take fewer risks. Um, and that's okay, but you also have to remember that it's moments like this when the risks pay off in multitudes. Autodesk is a good, a good, good example of this. Back, you know, th their former CEO is a guy named Carl Bass. He's kind of a legendary guy in, in the tech world. And back in, in the last financial crisis of 2007, 2008, he made a very, very bold decision, which was to migrate pretty much all of their products to the cloud. Right. They were it was a software company. You buy software and then you buy it again. And you, and, you know, his board supported him, but the customers really didn't like it because they're like, wait a minute, I got to now buy this thing. And, and the price changed and they actually suffered significantly. I mean, there was a, a moment where he was walking up and down Sand Hill Road in like 2009 trying to sell Autodesk for like three billion dollars. But he really leaned into this idea of the cloud because he really believed in it. He couldn't find a buyer. Um, he eventually bought a lot of stock in the company himself and did very well. When, when, when you know, by 2012, 13, 14, Autodesk really just exploded in growth. And part of that was because of this migration to the cloud. They had to do it. Mm -hmm. And it was a risk. And it was a hard risk to take. But they did it. So, again... I'm not saying every company is going to be wild and take all these risks and be willing to lose money. But at the same time, it's worth remembering that you can adjust your appetite for risk taking during more challenging times. But it's really important to still believe in that because without it, you're not going to get the payoff when the challenging time passes. How do you think organizations can learn to celebrate those failures? kind of a quirky example, but there's a, a company called Seventh Generation. You probably are familiar with their cleaning products. It was really the first big organic cleaning products company ever. And I interviewed the, the co-founders uh, about two years ago on how I built this. It's a beautiful story because they actually had a massive falling out. And it was the first time in like 25 years they ever got back together on the show. And it was really cool and cathartic and they had a great time. But one of the things that they did at the company which was so cool was every week they would have a, a team meeting and they would ask everybody, what was the worst mistake you made this week? What was the stupidest thing you did? And then they would vote on the stupidest one and that person got a gift certificate for dinner and a movie. Oh my okay? God, I love it. <laughs> and the point of that was to celebrate transparency and also for people to hear the mistakes other people made so they wouldn't repeat them. 
And they wanted people to be open about their mistakes so everybody could learn from them. And I just thought that was so cool. I mean, it's very brave. You're basically saying, I want everybody to be vulnerable here because you're ultimately you're serving the mission of the company. If we understand your failure and what went wrong, then we can learn from it and then we can course correct. And you are actually serving the company and serving the culture. And I just thought it was so cool. Imagine doing a version of that on an even bigger scale. I'm definitely jotting that down as a takeaway. Guy, in the just roster of people you've interviewed, they themselves have rightfully achieved empires. And I now look at what you and your partner have done in going beyond just the scope of how I built this, but now you have so much on your plate. And I'm wondering, as you examine even your own meteoric rise, in your company, do you have salient examples of when you culturally have lived by these three pillars of collaboration, risk-taking, and failure? We try to do it every day. And we don't hit the mark every day, but we really do. We're taking risks all the time. Any new show we start is a risk because it costs money, it may not work. All we can do is do the best work that we can do. You know, for us, when we start something, we're never convinced it's going to succeed. We can't be because starting a new product or a new brand is so hard. Even for me in this space, it's really hard. I mean, even if you're Coca-Cola, starting a new brand is hard. It's really, really hard. So imagine starting from nothing and trying to put it out into the world. And so, you know, what we do with all of our shows is try and put out something that we would listen to or we would consume. And if we feel like it's good enough to take an hour of my time to listen to, then we're willing to put it out into the world. And that's sort of our our limits test. And that's all we can do. That's within our control. And it might fail, you know, and it might not work, but that's okay. Because as long as we can control how good it is and how proud we are of it, then we know that we're on the right track. I remember another one of your episodes on HIBT where you were chatting with Butcher Box. Uh, and I remember him sharing that a, a failed venture is not a failed entrepreneur. So from your perspective, Guy, like, is there a moment in your life where you had that big failure, the one that you were so personally connected to was core to you. What would you be willing to share with us about maybe that lesson, that moment and how it stuck with you and how you remind yourself when you get into these moments where you have to take big bets? My career today, what I do today and the production companies that I founded today would not have happened without a very significant failure in my career, which was I started out as a reporter first an intern, but eventually a reporter for NPR 25 years ago. And I was very lucky. I had this very successful career as a young guy. I was 25. I was the bureau chief for NPR in in Berlin in 2001, you know, and I dreamed of being the main anchor of weekday news program on NPR, you know, and, and when it was sort of my turn or chance to kind of, I'd I'd been overseas, I covered the Iraq war and Afghanistan. I actually went to CNN for a couple of years and covered the Palestinian Israeli conflict. I had all this experience. I came back. Uh, I had hosted uh, the weekend version of all things considered. I wanted to be the weekday host so bad. And in 2011, I didn't get the job. And I was told that I wasn't the right fit. And that was crushing for me because that was my dream that I thought that that was the pinnacle of being a successful journalist. I was living in Washington, D.C. at the time, but that really was a kick in my butt because I I had to make a change. And the change I made was, not too, too long after that, to leave the world of news, to start podcasts. I started a show called The TED Radio Hour in 2012, and then eventually left NPR and, and continued to make new shows. And here we are today. I mean, that was a devastating, crushing experience because I thought I was finished. I thought my career was done, but it was just the beginning. And I think about it a lot because I remember how hard it was for me at that time, how much I wanted it and how, you know, how crushing it was to know that I wouldn't do this thing that was my dream, but it it wasn't meant to happen. And I'm so lucky it didn't happen. But I love that you can still go back to it and you hold it in your heart that it's, and it's allowing you to keep moving forward. I'm so glad our listeners got to get a bit more exposed to your 
vast career. And I think something that's very unique to you is all your ventures seem to be very human centric. And it's been just like a treasure trove to listen to your shows and hear the stories. And you always describe them as like their hero's journeys. I'm wondering, curious, you're already doing a ton. I know you just released this new podcast, but what what is next for Guy's hero's journey? Oh, man. Um, We just got through my son's bar mitzvah, so that felt quite (laughs) heroic. My wife, she did most of the work. I got to give her the credit. She really is amazing. Um, She's an accomplished lawyer and former Obama administration executive and and also bar mitzvah planner. So, I mean, pretty amazing. (laughs) Crowning Um, achievement. We're just hitting our stride with how I built this. You know, we're sort of seven years in and growing. And before the pandemic, we were doing a lot of live shows and we had a summit. So we want to go back to that. We want to bring our community back. We did an annual summit in San Francisco. I live in the Bay Area. So we have plans to build out more shows around kids and kids science and kids education, maybe even around entrepreneurship and kids. So we're looking into some cool ideas for hopefully for next year and and beyond. That would be incredible. Um, I'm a former early childhood educator and gosh, do we need to refresh our stuff, man? It is not practical stuff that we're teaching them. Very excited to see what you, what you do next with that. All right. You ready for the last question? I'm ready to go. Okay. So we asked this of all our guests. Okay. If you could describe sales in one word, what word would that be? I have the exact word. Persistence. Some of the greatest entrepreneurs I have ever interviewed started in sales. Why are they so good as entrepreneurs? Because if you want to pursue a life of entrepreneurship, you're pursuing, certainly early on in your career, a life of rejection. And no, rejection, no, not interested, not interested. Your idea is not good. No one's going to buy it. If it was so good, why is somebody else thought of it? That's sales. If you look at Sarah Blakely, she was a fax machine sales rep. She went door to door, office to office, trying to sell Rico fax machines and getting the door slammed in her face and people saying, not interested, no soliciting, get off my property. She needed that shield. She needed that thick skin to be able to go to milling factories in North Carolina and beg them to make a prototype of what would become Spanx. They all said no to her, but she didn't stop asking because she was used to hearing no. And and it's the same story time and again with great entrepreneurs. They start in sales. They, They start by selling a product and hearing people say no, not interested. And then eventually they are resilient to that word. And they can just plow right through it. So you got to be persistent. That's the word. Can I ask if you had to exercise persistence in selling how I built this? Like the whole notion and premise is we're going to go to executives from the most recognizable brands who outwardly have all the confidence, all the success. And we're going to strip them down to a human level. And that interview that you had in the New York Times with Nellie Bowles, you talk about, we're going to talk about when they're not ringing the bell, but when they're on the floor in the fetal position, did that take you selling internally? Yeah, I really appreciate how you describe it because it's really, it is how I think about the show, you know, that stripping people down to a human level. Um, It's, it's who are you before people take your call, you know? And, and, and the reason why that's important is because I want listeners to hear from people that they might venerate and revere and to know that they're just like that. (laughs) Like, I know it sounds like I'm in Us Weekly. Oh, just like us, celebrities, they take out the trash. But (laughs) it's true that everybody at one point had to convince people to take their call. You know, whether it was Barry Diller, who was in the mailroom, or Jeff Bezos, like they all had to convince people at some point to give them a shot. And there were times where people weren't willing to do it. And it's the same thing with how I built this. I you know, when I first ha- had the idea for the show, the feedback was, well, there are a million shows like this. And that's that's a perfectly good thing to say. But then I had to say, but I believe that I can bring something out of people in a way that maybe uh, listeners aren't hearing. And then you get a, a not more pushback and then more pushback or, well, but you know, is it just like celebrating these people who are wealthy? And then there's more pushback. And oftentimes, especially when you're talking about media or you know, things that are that are abstract, 
when you describe what it is, it's very hard for people to hear it or to see it. And so it does take a level of, I mean, imagine Seinfeld. I just started watching Seinfeld with my kids. Imagine pitching that show. <laughs> it really is a show about nothing. How they ever got that made is incredible because it is a brilliant, brilliant show. But it's amazing that that show was ever made. But thank God it was because it's one of the greatest TV comedy sitcoms ever made. Very true. Well, and I'm very grateful that you decided one day to take a class at Harvard Business School and get inspired uh, for others that didn't have the funds to take a Harvard Business Review class and get to hear the success story of others because I really do think you have to see it to believe it. And you're out there doing it every day, guys. So thank you. We appreciate you. you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Reveal. If you want more resources on how revenue intelligence can help you create high-performing sales teams, head on over to gong.io. If you like what you heard, we would love that five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. 